So here's another interesting thing. We actually looked at from the low end, we went and saw what are the interrupt requests that are coming in. So you're getting an interrupt request if you're working with disk, if you're working with the network, any kind of hardware device. So this little red blob there, that's basically a bunch of disk I.O. And the blue is referring to timers. So what we're seeing here on the x-axis is basically, again, one second granularities. But the y-axis here is actually something different. This is an idea that Brendan back there actually came up with. So this is basically we're looking at the sub-second offset. So we're saying, OK, we're looking at this once per second, but when in the second is it occurring? So is it occurring you know, at half a second, at three-fourths of a second, you know, 200 milliseconds, so when? So with this, we can actually look at patterns. So there's continuous, and unfortunately, so the projector didn't quite get the image well. There basically are predominantly straight lines. This refers to regular timer activity. So you have a program that says, wake me up. The business says fire timer or sig alarm most commonly at a fixed interval. So fire this like every five seconds or fire every second. So you're going to see that always happen at the same place. But a lot of times we actually have programs that follow the pattern of wake up, do some work, go back to sleep for a second. Wake up, do some work, go back to sleep for a second. And because we don't take into account the time that we actually are doing that work, you're actually going to see when that happens and when it wakes up, it's actually going to slowly drift. And with that, you can kind of Unfortunately, hard to make out here. Um, there's actually a series of increasingly sloping lines. So you have sloping lines that basically reflect that behavior. Here, we're basically looking at disk I/O latency. So we can basically look at the guest, and we, here we are doing an apt get update and install of a few packages. Basically, say, okay, how long does the disk take to respond? What's kind of the logical? How long are each read and write taking? So. Again, you have on the x-axis time, the y-axis, um, basically, what's the latency? And here's kind of a really interesting thing. Here we're actually able to go in, we're actually sampling the C virtual CPU. So we can actually say, what programs is the guest running? Now, unfortunately, we don't have a way of saying, translating this into an executable name. Yeah. I don't, can't tell you if this is MySQL, or in this case, um, it ended up being Jack the Ripper. Um, what, what we can tell you is basically just that what, how many different programs they are. So what we're seeing here is we're sampling the CPU at a fixed frequency. And we're basically going to say, again, we're doing the sub-second offset. We're going to say, what program basically is on this CPU at that time? So the way we can figure out what program is that there's a register on the CPU that's called CR3. Uh, CR3 refers to the root of the page table. And so each program is actually going to have its own set of hardware page tables. So it has a different root, page table root. So because of this, we actually can say that we can't tell you what program it is, but we know if it's the same program or not. So we can sample it, grab the value of this register, and basically use that. So here, basically, we see that we don't have much running. Then we basically start up one CPU-bound process, which is, in this case, a password ripper just because that would take some time. It's a nice CPU-bound activity. Then we start up a second one. So here you can actually see that they're actually, the scheduler is actually alternating which one is running during these time slices. So that's how we can actually see what's going on and kind of how we can visualize that. So just kind of what we're actually doing here. First thing we do is we're sampling the CPU and we set at 99 hertz. And we actually chose 99 and not 100 for a reason. So if you actually do things at 100 hertz or 1,000 hertz, you actually are going to overlap with traditional, the most operating systems have something called clock, which is a function that's going to fire actually every 10 milliseconds or maybe every 100 milliseconds, and it does some regular work. Um, and so if you actually fire at that same frequency as it fires, you're going to actually unfairly bias your samples. So to get around that, you basically just don't profile at 100 hertz. So profile at 99 or 999 or one, two, three, four, you know, kind of whatever frequency you really want to use. So this is actually the dtrace script that we ran that actually could generate this, that we could then graph and visualize. So basically say here, use the VM regs to actually grab out the value of CR3. Then we're going to aggregate that basically as a base 16 string. And then we're basically going to use that as a key in an aggregation. So Whenever we see the same value of CR3, that's going to be the key that we care about. Finally, what we want to do is we're going to do a 
the value there is going to be a linear quantized. So basically, we're going to break down into these buckets, these power of 10 based buckets. And we're going to go through basically every time we get an event with that register, so with the same CR3 value, we're going to go in and bump the appropriate, appropriate value based on when it's occurring in the second. So then can we do better? So this is a little bit of fantasy future land, but so why? So we can't detrace into the guest. I mean, right now, that's just given what we have. That's actually pretty hard to do. But can we? But we actually have ideas on how we actually could do this. So maybe the guest doesn't support detrace, or say you're running Windows, you just want to have some idea of what Windows is actually doing. This would be really nice, and really powerful. But we're not there yet. So the way detrace works is it actually modifies the program text. So it's actually going to go in, see what instructions are running. Actually, it's going to tweak one of them, and that's how it knows how to work it. So, the first problem we have to deal with here is we actually have to understand how to walk these nested hardware page tables. So we actually need to go through and say, well, we know how to walk normal page tables, because that's what the operating system does all day. It walks these page tables. But now we have to actually go through and understand how to walk the secondary set of hardware page tables, which is basically adding yet another layer of kind of indirection and mappings. Once we have that, and basically we know how to get to the memory, then we need to figure out how to actually cause, get the data. So, dtrace is causing interrupts. But if you do an interrupt in a guest, you're just going to interrupt in the guest's kernel. You're actually not going to get that. So, an alternative strategy is actually to find a way to efficiently induce VM exits. So, basically cause the guest to stop processing, exit back into the hypervisor, and then quickly realize that this is why you're doing it and send it back in. Once you have those pieces, I mean, the kernel's just program text. It's sitting in Kimu's address space, so you can just go and tweak it as you want. So it's all there, and you just got to do it in a safe way and make sure you don't basically break anything. So some examples of kind of what you can do or what would be nice is kind of virtual equivalents to what we already have. So an FBT provider, so basically you can know every entry and exit of a function call in the guest kernel. And to do that, you're going to need a little bit of help with the symbol table. You can also basically go and have a syscall provider, so you can know when syscalls are happening, and the notion of a PID provider. So wrapping up, we're kind of talking about SmartOS as a hypervisor. The whole idea is basically, if you want a high level of tenancy, you can use OS virtualization, because you can really drive that up. You don't need to emulate all the hardware that exists. If you need OS flexibility, you can leverage KVM for that. You know, this is all designed to be highly observable with Dtrace. So you can actually understand what's going on. Why is my system slow? And then there's basically strong isolation and protection built in from the ground up with zones and crossbow. With ZFS, you basically have your data. This is designed to be protected and easy to manage. There's a bunch of management tools to make your life easier, such as VMADM data, something we've done. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. And yeah. Hey there. Uh, so uh, this seems, in many respects, uh, a little bit architecturally similar to running the LDOMs on a uh, Spark Coolprint server, which seems to have a somewhat similar architecture. Uh, do you uh, have you worked with that architecture at all? And I mean, this seems to basically be the same as if you have different zones or different logical domains uh, on a cool threads uh, with a very similar approach to uh, using a. Uh, the Zmol or the uh, virtual artist, etc. Was that your uh, inspiration as you did this? Or? Um, so the only Spark stuff I ever did was I did hardware verification for some of the Spark chips back in the day. Um, I never actually had access to any of the uh, Cool Threads boxes. So um, Spark hardware is unfortunately very expensive and just something I've never really been able to get my hands on. So I actually wasn't familiar with the underlying details of how they did LDOMs. So that's good to know that we kind of came to the same place. I think architecturally, you see that. Um, the underlying OS, uh, the capabilities of ZFS and Crossbow, they're designed to solve kind of the same problems. So, I mean, LDOMS is a spark way to do this, right? We have zones for, we have zones for, you know, uh, OS virtualization, and now we have KVM that gives us a hardware virtualization in x86 space. So, um, there are other problems, you know, certainly the isolation, resource management, they're all very similar. So it, it, it's only logical that you have a certain amount of conversion as an evolution 
especially from engineers who have, have exposure to some level or some of the same stuff. Yeah, very much. Yeah. I had a question. Um, are you familiar with the Linux uh, LXC project, which I understand is kind of maybe similar to Zones? Um, I have some, I mean, I have some basic familiarity with LXC and some of the basic functionality there. I've never actually had the chance to use it or deploy it, so I can't really talk to it there. But but is it is that is that is that a kind of an, an analogy to a Zone? Um, it's definitely the notion of having containers is kind of the similar idea. You need to have some form of operating system virtualization, so. Whether you do that from the style of jails, which is VSD jails, and then you kind of go all the way up to zones, um, where LXC fits in with all the different name spacing and kind of all the protection domains, I honestly can't give you the best answer. The last time I went through a Linux kernel and did you know, all the configuration, you know, it was in the two six days, and there's a lot of new developments going there, so I really can't give you a fair answer to that. Other questions? Up here, there's one up, what, front? How does uh, VM migration work within uh, SmartOS when you're using KVM? And can you can you do live migration at all? Do you need uh, shared storage? And have you looked at using uh, the ZFS storage? Okay, so it's a question. So um, currently in the release of SmartOS that we have, there isn't a support for live migration. That's something that we're actively working on. And by design, we're not targeting requiring the same. So you just would be able to use local storage. And you would be able to use local correct. storage. Correct, you would use local storage. Migration. Correct, that's the hope. And that's the send and receive uh, ZFS feature. So that would be one way, so what you'd want to do is, some way if you were kind of thinking about it, you basically do a send and receive with the ZVOL, then you kind of do incremental receives until you got to the point where you could do the final migrations. So that's definitely something that you want to see there, and if it's not there, yeah. Great, thank you. How would you implement high availability? In what respect? What do you want to be highly available? Uh, the, the guest OS. We would honestly, I would suggest that you look at that actually at the application level because that's honestly where it makes more sense. I mean, what does it actually mean for the guest OS to be highly available? Uh, does it mean the process, the given process is actually running in multiple places at the same time? Or I mean, what exactly does it mean? So, Well, in the past I've done with um, application servers that run a specific application that if the host that they're running on um, yes, the OS dies, then it's quickly brought up within a few minutes on another live host, so my downtime is at maximum a few minutes. Um, well, I, would, I think I would honestly focus on this in the application layer, where it actually I think it makes a lot more sense than trying to bring up and migrate the VM. I know that's a popular approach that that's not the approach that VMware has historically done, but it, what you end up seeing is you end up seeing a lot of work and effort being done and put into that migration process, you end up requiring a lot of the SAN features there, and it actually makes it harder to actually do this, whereas you have, for example, um, like Postgres and MySQL had basically asynchronous replication or even synchronous replication built in in various degrees and kind of in the database layers, and depending on what your application is, it makes more sense to design it from that perspective. Because ultimately, you can keep saying, well, what if my data center loses its power? You know, I lose power or I lose the internet connection. Well, now, I mean, where do I do so we keep on doing the levels of protection? So. It's always a tricky thing, and it's kind of for understanding what your, the trick is figure out what's the right tool for the job there. And oftentimes we're seeing that doing that um, at the application layer makes more sense, especially because we historically are doing cloud hosting.